I cannot be more delighted with our inaugural speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Lindsay. Um, you can read all about Michael on this card here, and some of you probably already have. Uh, I've been in a bunch of rooms like this over the years where Michael has been introduced, and almost invariably people uh, talk about how brilliant he is, how hardworking he is, how he gets more done in a week than most of us get done in a year, and those things are very, very true. Uh, but I've known Michael for over a decade now, and I want to talk about one aspect that doesn't get talked about, I don't think, enough, and that is that Michael is gifted with incredible kindness. Um, Michael, you've been disarmingly kind. I got to know you first, I think I was had just turned 30, and for whatever reason, you took an interest in me, and you have been an encourager to me uh, in so many ways in my career, uh, and I've just respected you and looked up to you and so appreciated all that you've done on my behalf. And uh, it was October of 2014, we were having breakfast at a hotel in Chicago, and uh, Hannah and I were living in the Chicago area. We were perfectly happy. We had our few kids. Um, and we were not looking to make any moves at all. And Michael, over breakfast, said, Joel, have you heard of this place called Jill's House? And I said, no, I've never heard of this place called Jill's House. And so I did my internet research and um, uh, thought kind of cool place, but maybe not for me. Which, like I said, we were happy. But God intervened in a few other ways with other people in my life. Uh, who nudged me in this direction. So Alice told a very kind story about the leadership transition at Jill's house. Uh, the truth is, uh, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel and I was going to say yes to it. Uh, but uh, Michael is the first one who told me about this wonderful place that I have come to know and love, and it's such a privilege to serve. Uh, you are all going to be blessed by Michael. Um, as I said, you can read all about him here. He's done incredible things. Uh, but tonight, uh, he's here as a husband to Rebecca. Uh, and he's here as a dad to three wonderful girls who you will hear about as well. So, Michael, thank you. Uh, we are deeply honored to be here. Uh, Rebecca and I are so grateful. We have been fans of Jill's house for many, many years and uh, have just a deep appreciation. I think Joel is amazing, and you all are very blessed to have him as your executive director. And, uh, of course, we love Ken and Alice. Uh, Ken's been such an encourager to me throughout my career, and Alice is, I think, the most gifted fundraiser I know, and yeah. she can get all kinds of good things done. I first actually got to meet um, Judge Starr because I was working on my dissertation at Princeton, and I was interviewing senior leaders who are also uh, people of faith. And I went to do the interview, at the time he was the dean of the law school at Pepperdine, and I went out and, uh, in characteristic Ken fashion, within five minutes, he had charmed me completely. And I found myself just sort of enamored with this man, uh, gracious, kind, and embodied the grace and truth uh, in so many ways. So um, it's a, a great professional and personal honor to be able to come and give a lecture <coughs> or, um, named after somebody that I love so deeply. No doubt the most beloved hymn of all time has to be Amazing Grace, penned in 1792 by that slave trader turned preacher known as John Newton. Although uh, Amazing Grace is his most recognized hymn, Newton actually wrote over 300 hymns that have been part of the Christian tradition. He ended up uh, working with William Wilberforce and with colleagues to try and bring about the end of the British slave trade. And a number of historians have noted uh, the simple and yet profound truths that are found in the writings of uh, his hymns. As he himself writes, I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. The message of the hymn is one of great redemption, but also of hope. The Lord hath promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Several years ago, um, the story of uh, John Newton and William Wilberforce got made into a major motion picture known as Amazing Grace. And as part of that, they invited Chris Tomlin, the singer-songwriter, to add a verse. Chris has said, who decides to do that? Who's going to mess with amazing grace? Are you kidding? <laughs> but I think he saw there was a really good opportunity. And as part of that, he added something that says, My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, 
His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. In my work, I get a chance to work with amazing college students every single day. And we've been thinking about how you develop the next generation of servant leaders who go out into different vocations and are prepared to make a positive difference where they see their whole lives as a vocational calling, whether it is uh, to ministries like Jill's House or to the church or in law or government or business or science and technology. We really want to help our students at Taylor to see their whole lives as being one that uh, ought to be submitted to God to try and do good and great things. And as part of that, I've got a chance to work with some extraordinary students. I was talking not too long ago with them about the book of 1 Peter, which is really an um, epistle, small little slender piece of the New Testament that gives some helpful admonitions and encouragements for the faithful as we think about what we are called to do, whatever our calling, whatever our responsibilities might be. The book's author, of course, was the mercurial, passionate disciple who Jesus loved enough that he would walk on the water, but also he denied him three times when it mattered a lot. We see in chapter one of that very small little book of the Bible, Peter writes, Thistle to those who are grieved by various trials. And he writes to them to remind them that even though you face trials and challenges across your life, we have a much greater cause for hope that is to guide us and direct us and help support us. I'm a sociologist by training, and it's interesting to see how uh, a lot of social science research of the last 50 years has basically confirmed ideas that were written into the words of scripture. And we see, for example, that having uh, an overall sense of hope and purpose has a way of giving folks a sense of endurance and fortitude, or what uh, one social psychologist has called grit, to persevere. And in the process of that, it helps people to navigate the challenges that come along the way. We're reminded in this little verse that we can cast all our cares upon God because he cares for us, and that we recognize that there are people and situations that are like the adversary who roars around like a lion to devour us, and yet we can take courage because God has made a way for the faithful to, in the end, to prevail. We believe that Peter wrote this little volume in Rome sometime between 60 and 64 AD. It was a really difficult time to be a Christian. Persecution was on the rise, and there was a lot of questions and challenges. And Peter, writing into that context, gave a word of admonition. Don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. In other words, he admonished the faithful to figure out ways that we could be a blessing to other people. We're a far cry from what the early church experienced in 64 AD. Indeed, if there is anyone who has been blessed among the faithful, surely it is folks like us. There's never been a more educated, a better resource, a healthier, a wealthier, a, a better connected group of faithful who have walked the earth than the, those of us living today. Major opportunities. We do indeed face uh, challenges. But there's something that's much bigger in our life. And I think that Jill's house has a way of pointing us to be reminded of a much bigger picture. Every year on April 9th, I get a pit in my stomach. That day is seared in my mind because uh, when I was in seminary, I took a class on the life and writings of the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And April 9th is the day that Bonhoeffer was executed. Bonhoeffer was an intriguing, countercultural kind of pastor in Germany in the 1930s because he eventually got involved in the plot to assassinate Hitler. That's why eventually he was sent to a concentration camp and eventually executed. But the reason why I get a pit in my stomach the most is because he literally died within days of his concentration camp being freed by the Allied forces. And so it feels like such a waste. I mean, here is a man who was eminently learned, a very talented theologian, who wrote works that would engage the life of scholars for decades, but also could connect with average, ordinary um, believers. I mean, his 
do a classic work on Christian community called Life Together. It's literally inspired the name of the community covenant we have at Taylor, and all of our students read it. So this is a man of great intellect, but he also had just a wonderful pastoral sensibility. How much more good could he have done if he could just have made it until the Allied forces arrived at that camp? And yet, for some reason, it didn't work out that way. I have to say, in the kind of spiritual economy that I would design, uh, that would not have happened. Like, God would have protected him <laughs> until the Allied forces got there, so he could write more, he could preach more, we could celebrate his good story. I mean, I love the story of William Wilberforce because in the end, he wins, and it's a great victory, and the faithful are successful. But I have to also recognize the reality is that not every faithful Christian leader gets to enjoy that celebration. And that's the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. There is something about the upside down world of God's economy where ours is a God who used the simple to school the learned. One who cares for the one who is often forgotten and lifts them up to a place of great honor. That is also part of the great gift of Jill's house. I spent much of my uh, Christian life assuming that we go through seasons of great challenge and burden, and then we also go through seasons of great blessing and joy. And I sort of saw them as sort of going one after another, sort of in a regular cadence. But actually, I've come to realize that much of the life of faith is like traveling down parallel tracks where you experience both blessings and burdens at the same time. I first encountered this while I was a doctoral student, and uh, I had gotten invited uh, to go to a party that Rupert Murdoch was throwing for the evangelical pastor Rick Warren. It was at the Rainbow Room atop 30 Rockefeller Plaza in New York City, and they were celebrating the 20 millionth copy of Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, uh, being sold. It was the best-selling book in human history aside from the Bible. And it was interesting because there were two kinds of people in the room. There was like the New York publishing elite crowd, and there were Rick Warren's evangelical friends. <laughs> and they mixed like water and oil. <laughs> I was a graduate student at Princeton at the time, so a lot of people assumed I was with, sort of with the New York elite publishing people, but I knew a lot of the friends of Rick Warren, so I played to both sides. <laughs> I remember there was a, a friend who was there that I got to know. He was a professor at Yale. And he turned to me and he said, I hear there are lots of evangelicals around. Do you know any of those people? And I said, I sure do. Would you like to meet a few of them? So we made some connections. You would have thought that the night that Rick Warren is celebrating in one of the most iconic spots in Midtown Manhattan, the 20 millionth copy of his book being sold, I mean, that would be like the ultimate moment of great joy and celebration. But at that very moment, he was also grieving the fact that his wife Kay had received a cancer diagnosis and their son was battling depression. I mean, at the very same moment. From a distance, people who didn't know Rick would assume that he was just living on top of the world when in fact he was carrying around a really heavy burden. You might look at my life and assume that everything is all happy and bright and sunny. But uh, I might assume the same of you, when in truth, we all carry around burdens in the very moment when we're smiling and we have reasons for great joy and celebration. I think one of the things that we have to be reminded of is that part of the calling is to just endure. Because life is hard and it's not fair. And I think Jill's house families understand that perhaps more deeply than others. That sometimes it just does not make sense. I wish I could say I had things all figured out, even as I am excited about great things that are happening in my family and in my professional life. Truth be told, there are parts of my life that are sullen and sad and make things really challenging. But I have found that as we both 
celebrate the blessings and we endure through the burdens, we have a way of being drawn more closely into the presence of God. And that's also one of the great gifts of Jill's house. I don't often speak about the journey that my wife, um, Rebecca, and I have had parenting our oldest daughter, Elizabeth. When Elizabeth um, uh, was born, everything was right in the world. Rebecca had had a great pregnancy. Um, we didn't know it, but Rebecca had been in labor for quite a while. Um, we had our small group over for dessert that evening, and Rebecca wasn't feeling so great. I was frantically working on a grant proposal to the National Science Foundation, and I was trying to get it done before that baby came. And uh, Rebecca was sort of moaning back in the bedroom, and finally she said, well, I think my water just broke. She said the next sound she heard was my laptop closing. And she realized that I'd finally gotten Michael's attention. <laughs> we go to the hospital, Elizabeth is born, and we assume everything was going to be just perfect. But within about 12 hours of life, we realized that something wasn't quite right. It would take us actually three years before we learned that Elizabeth had been born with a very rare genetic disorder, fewer than 500 known cases. But uh, there's no cure for Elizabeth's situation. And uh, it's been an interesting journey of parenting Elizabeth. We don't live in Washington, so we've not been able to take advantage of the respite care that Jill's house provides. But I have to say, I'm a big believer in it. Do you know that 85% of the marriages that have a special needs child in it end in divorce? And I understand it. Because we've had lots of help and support and encouragement from family and friends, but it is tough. I'll never forget when we were living in Princeton and uh, we were really struggling of figuring something out. And we went to this one doctor who said that we needed to put Elizabeth in an early intervention program, and the state didn't provide the support, but we would need to pay for it privately. And we saw the price tag, and I said to the doctor, this, th this is what it costs for a child to go to Harvard for a year. I I'm a grad student. Like, my graduate stipend is $16,000 a year. This is $48,000 a year. I couldn't possibly do it. And she said, well, if you don't do it, I don't think there's any chance your child will ever go to college. And I realized in that moment, it's going to be really a different journey than what we had expected. And it has been. <clears throat> Elizabeth uh, has problems with her internal organs. She has uh, neutropenia, which means she has uh, dangerously low white blood cell count. I'll never forget, they told us if a pandemic ever broke out, we need to put her in a bubble. I was like, what is a pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> so when COVID hit, I would say we were really nervous. <clears throat> Um, Elizabeth has very, very low uh, vision, so she wears really strong glasses. And um, she has profound cognitive disability. She is now 19 years old, but she has the cognitive development of probably an 18-month-old. She doesn't have language, though she can make noises, and let me tell you, she can express her will. For sure. <laughs> we have uh, Elizabeth, who is 19, and then we have twin daughters, Emily and Caroline, who are 13. They are typical. But uh, having three teenage daughters in the house is quite an interesting experience. I'm going to write a book about the experience. The title of the book is Tears at Breakfast. <laughs> we have lots of drama in the Lindsay household. It sounds like you might understand this. Yes. So Elizabeth has been a real encouragement to us. Because Elizabeth uh, doesn't have language, we don't always know what she's thinking. She can't necessarily give an articulate uh, defense of our Christian faith. But I think that Elizabeth has learned what is important to our family and how we've tried to inculcate things along the way. We lived in Boston for 10 years, and Elizabeth attended a, a special needs school toward the latter part of our time in Boston. It's a wonderful place called the Children's Center for Communication. It wasn't a faith-based school. And uh, it was filled with people of many different faiths and of no faith at all. But it was interesting to see how extraordinary things can happen when you're given a chance to give an account for the faith that you have within you. And for her, uh, it tended to come in ways that she would make requests. You see, Elizabeth is a huge fan of an a cappella group out of BYU called Noteworthy a women's uh, a cappella group, and they do wonderful renditions of different songs, and her absolute favorite 
is the rendition of Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. And she loves watching that video. And because of that, it's actually a reward for when she does things well. So we ended up teaching the school. This was one way in which, if you want Elizabeth to do something, she would watch Amazing Grace. And uh, they couldn't do anything about it because that's the reward that she wanted. <laughs> and so it was really wonderful to be able to see how she would make this request just about every day, and they would have to play it, not just for Elizabeth, but for her whole class, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. We made a short little video just so you could see a little bit about Elizabeth and our family and this particular uh, experience of how she's helped us to bear witness to our faith. Let's watch. Two, three, four, five. Did you make five tokens? You did. You have a good body and a quiet voice, and you're following directions. Yeah. Amazing grace. Is that what you want? Amazing Once, grace? Listen, singing church songs. Amazing grace. Is that what you want? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> What's great about Elizabeth is she's funny, she's smart. It's cool to see her when she uses her AAC device because she can really express the things that are important to her. Um, her faith, she expresses her faith a lot through her music and through the choices that she makes and that her family is important to her. So when Elizabeth listens to her preferred songs, there's a couple different things that you can see change in her. She becomes calmer and more focused, but she also becomes happier. So the way that we teach Elizabeth is we break tasks down into very small steps, and we teach those steps, and then she receives tokens or reinforcement for when she completes those steps as asked. Her favorite by far is to choose to listen to music. She typically will choose her church songs and Amazing Grace is a long time favorite. is usually that they, they have learned to love her music too. That they're um, saying that they like it or they think it's great. Or we have a student who likes to comment, Pita Keen Jelly Bean. <laughs> And I think she, we're just really lucky to have her on the earth. It's just amazing to get to learn from her, too. So what about Amazing Grace? Do you want more or that? More. You want more Amazing
told not to be afraid when we encounter challenges or burdens that are in our life, but to instead to bear witness. If a sweet child who really has no language to speak of can uh, bear witness to the amazing grace we have come to know in the redemptive work of God, how much more should we be willing to do that? I learned a lot from Elizabeth, and it's a great blessing to be able to see how ministries like Jill's House have made things an easier load for us in our own journey. We're very grateful for your support. You should all give a lot more money to Jill's House. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing institution. And my own child is not a direct beneficiary, but boy, do I believe in this place. Because it makes a difference in the lives of so many strengthening marriages and families, supporting kids, and even creating ways where we can also be encouraged. We have been blessed in order to be a blessing. May that be true of us all. God bless you.